Good morning. So I didn't mean to startle you. That was a little, it came in a little hot there. It's good to see you this beautiful morning. Would you join me? Stand together. Let's sing together one of the true greats. Hymn number 43, great is thy faithfulness. You can find it in your hymn book or on either side of me. Great is thy faithfulness. hope that you have found some new mercies this morning to discover. Would you remain standing and join me in reading together our words of witness? We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, goodness, and love, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord and Savior, who for us and our salvation lived and died and rose again and lives evermore, and in the Holy Spirit, who takes the things of Christ and reveals them to us, renewing, comforting, and inspiring our souls. We are united in striving to know the will of God as taught in the Holy Scriptures and in our purpose to walk in the ways of the Lord, made known 
or to be made known to us. Amen. Amen. Would you uh, say good morning to someone as you return to your seats? Last week, as you know, was the culmination of our backpack and food, food card drive. And uh, just wanted to know that it was super successful. Thanks to all of you. I really want to thank everybody. The missions committee wants to thank you. Last Tuesday, uh, everybody showed up for us. I want to thank all those who showed up to fill all 40 backpacks and get them over to Trinity Church. We even had some left, uh, some backpack supplies left over, so those will be used on, in other backpacks because there will be a total of about 900 to 1,000 backpacks that will be given out to the members of the community later on today at Sylvan Park. So it's really exciting. I want to thank you all for that. In addition, I wanted to let you know that you, got, you guys delivered when it came to gift cards. We got $1,120 in food gift cards. And Allison, who is the head of Micah House, is really excited about that because she's getting ready to go buy food uh, for the kids tomorrow, in fact. So they'll start using those right away. So thank you again, everybody, for a successful campaign. We couldn't have done it without all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to apologize to anyone watching on YouTube. I think I may have left my mic on during the Gloria Patri, so sorry about that. Uh, also, if you are here and you are new or newish, and that is a broad term if you've basically been coming uh, to our church since COVID, uh, at the, since after we started regathering, I want to invite you to join us in the library for a brunch. I'll be there. I'll share a little bit about the history of our church, uh, a little bit our, about our guiding values and what the next steps are, what, it, what we mean by the congregational way. So if you're new or newish and heard the word library and aren't sure where that is, you qualify for this brunch. Uh, it is room one, so if you head down the steps towards the parking lot, you'll see a one, a door with the number one on it in our Christian Education Building. That's where we'll be uh, after today's worship service, start around 10.45, so I wanna invite you to join us there. Good morning. A couple other things uh, just for us to be mindful of. The Redlands Bowl reached out and they're in need of ushers this Friday, the 9th. If you're interested in helping out and you're available, uh, you can let Ashley know. That I've had this fly flying around me. Have you seen it? It's driving me nuts. It's my new friend. Sorry. Um, <laughs> focused. Uh, so August 9th is the date, but uh, if you're interested, you're available, and you, maybe you've even done it before, you can let Ashley know. You can email her, go into the office, 
um, and we will pass that information along. Ashley also has the meeting times and all of that, so she can provide that for you as well today. Um, Sunday school also re resumes next Sunday, so uh, kids get prepared for that. We're really excited um, for you to have your classes again and spend time with one another. As we transition in our time of worship to a time of offering and giving, uh, as always, uh, as Roslyn emphasized, is that you are a very generous church. Um, and so just to acknowledge that once again, um, we are so grateful for your generosity and we continue to seek to steward that well prayerfully and as groups of leadership considering how we can best use the resources um, that is supporting this congregation to meet the needs, not, of, not only of each other, but our community as well. Uh, so we have our donation. You can give any offering in the back in the baskets that we have to keep one another safe. You can donate online at redlands.church or come into the office during our office hours and we will receive that from you as well. Thank you. We wanted to also let you know uh, that Ruth Ann Nidum this week was found out that she has lung cancer. Uh, she is out in Montana and is on her way home back to us. Uh, she asked that you remember her in her prayers as she uh, surely has a long road ahead. So let's take a moment um, to pray. Let's remember Ruth Ann, particularly during our moment of silence at the end. And I invite you in our time of silence to remember those who you know uh, who are suffering uh, in some way that we might join together and pray uh, for the peace and health and healing of those whom we love. Would you join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, all of us here are in need of your healing touch. This morning we come like sheep in need of a shepherd. We come like children needing a parent. We come as the lost needing to find our way home again. Good Father, we are united together this morning in our need for you. We pray for Ruth Ann, alongside all we know who are afflicted with cancer, with memory loss, with aching joints and chronic illness. We pray together for the wisdom of doctors, the comfort of friends and family, and for hope and peace as despair and loneliness only adds to our burdens. Good Father, we are united this morning in our need for you. We pray for those who are afflicted with mental illness, those impacted by an unseen illness that robs our joy, our clarity of mind, our peace. Good Father, we need you. We thank you for your goodness. Great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies we see in all the seasons of our life. The joy, the good times, the happy memories remind us of your goodness in the hard, difficult seasons where we need you to barge in and interrupt our life with peace and joy. We need you and we thank you that for those who seek you, find you. May we find you today and may you reveal yourself to us through your peaceful presence, your light yoke, and your easy burden. Take a minute in silence prayer to come before your God.
Would you join me in praying together just as Jesus taught his disciples to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, hello. This has been a busy, awful year for me. And when I think of that, I think of the song, Through It All, by Andre Crouch. And that's my choice for this morning. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions about tomorrows. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God brought blessed consolation that my trials only come to make me strong. Through to trust in Jesus, I've learned to trust in God, through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon my Lord. I've been to lots of places I've seen a lot of faces there have been times I felt so all alone but in those lonely hours yes those precious lonely hours Jesus let me know that I was his own. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend upon my Lord. I thank God for the mountain. I thank him for the valleys. I thank him for the storms he sees me through. For if I'd never had a problem, I'd never know that he could solve them. I'd never know what faith in God could do. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. 
to trust in God through it all, oh, through it all, I've learned to depend upon my Lord. Yes, I've learned to depend upon his word. Are we on? Okay. This morning's scripture is Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14, which can be found on pages 1349 and 1350 in the Bible in the pews, or you can read along up on the screen. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath, enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skid covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life, and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the God. No surprise, I'm nervous. <laughs> I've been wrestling with this one all week. I was joking with John about that today. 
Um, two orders of business. The first one is if you want to use your pew Bibles, I'm going to jump back and forth between texts, and sometimes it's helpful, at least for me, to know where we're at in the text. So I'm going to be in Mark 4 a little bit this morning. Um, Mark 4, which is on page 1,561. So Mark 4, 1,561. And then, as Jane so wonderfully read, Ezekiel 37 on page 1349. The second order of business is I have a question for you. How many of you know what Star Wars is? Can you just raise your I got nervous for a minute. I'm going to talk about Star Wars and nobody knows what I'm talking about. I, I took a risk. It's been around since the 70s, right? So you're familiar with the Force? I think we're all good there. Okay. So several years ago at Disneyland, uh, they had this really fantastic sort of thing that they put on for kids, which was called the Jedi Training Academy. It was over by Space Mountain, which I think is now renamed Hyperspace Mountain. And it was sort of this open air gathering that they would have where kids, they could register to become young Jedi. The official term is Padawan for you nerds like me out there. But a young Jedi, they would get robes, they'd be robed up and they would get lightsabers. And they would get to be a part of this fun adventure where they would learn how to use their lightsaber. They would get to partner with different cast members that were famous Jedi in all of the movies that we may be familiar with. And the culmination of that moment is throughout the day at this Jedi Training Academy, they would put on shows. And these young Jedi would get to participate as part of the show. So they would have the dark side, they have the Jedis. They'd have all of the narration around it and they would battle and they would fight. And these young Padawan would be sitting watching, and then some of them would get invited up to participate. Um, I'm sure you can imagine, uh, there's still YouTube videos about this, but when you give a little kid permission to hit an adult with a sword, it's, it's going to be a good show. Um, it never disappointed. And so this little Padawan with the lightsaber would be fighting, usually like Darth Vader or a more recent character, Kylo Ren. And it was always a struggle, inevitably, because you have an adult against a kid. And so at the moment of struggle, the narrator would invite all of the people that are watching, because remember, this is a live show. So there's adults, there's other kids that are wanting to be those Padawans and can't be. And the narrator says that these kids, we need your help. We need you to use the force to help this young Jedi defeat this evil man. It's always a guy by the way. <laughs> and so stick your hands out, they would say, stick your hands out. And they would. Uh, when Caleb was about three or four years old, he was at that show. And he was watching this young Padawan fight. And he was invited to stick out his hands. Here's a, a picture of him in that moment. You can see on the screens and hopefully he's all in. He's ready to go. And so he sticks out his hands with all the other the kids in the audience. And suddenly, Kylo Ren is defeated by the force. And this next picture was his reaction. <laughs> I love it. What well, you're laughing and you're connecting with this is because there's something really innocent about that moment, isn't there? like uh, all the adults, for every single kid that was sticking out their hands like this. And then Kylo Ren is defeated and they're like, wait a minute, what power do I have? There's adults that are rolling their eyes because they're in on the secret, aren't they? There's this gap that we experience between what it's like to have this childlike belief that somebody could tell us something that's wildly impossible, but for us it's possible. And we lean into it and we just believe and do. But as adults, we kind of lose that imagination and awe over time, don't we? I don't want to presume upon you, but I do. I don't think I have the force. I don't think I could stick my hand out and defeat Kylo Ren. And so as I was thinking about the Ezekiel 37 text, and I was thinking about 
my own faith. And again, I don't want to project upon you. So my invitation this morning is that you consider your faith today, your heart and your mind. It's less of a challenge and more of like, we're a work in progress and just to acknowledge that together. And so as I was thinking about Ezekiel 37, I started to be confronted with the reality about my faith, which is sometimes I struggle to have hope. And sometimes I struggle to believe. Sometimes I struggle to imagine a world that is different than the world that I see and hear around me, perhaps on the news. Can you relate to that? Where you're, you're, you, you want to, but inevitably you can't. And I began to ask God, like, is it possible for me to have my version as an adult of what Caleb experienced at the Jedi Academy? Can I have awe and imagination again, or am I just stuck in this place where I'm constantly wondering what hope and belief and a new way of being could possibly look like in Christ? And so I was praying, and as I uh, was praying, I was just looking through scripture, and I came across a familiar parable. Perhaps you have read it or have heard a sermon or two about it. It's the parable of the sower. Is that familiar to you? And as I was reading through it, something that I certainly read before jumped out to me in a way that it hadn't previously. I'm gonna read it for you so that way you can follow along with me. That's why I invited you to have your pew Bible. It's Mark 4. Uh, It's Mark 4, verses 3 through 8, and I'll read it, but you can follow along on the screens as well. It says, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed, And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, it grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Later, Jesus is with his disciples and they're trying to decipher what this parable means. They're trying to connect with it and have some understanding. What what are you talking about, Jesus? And he responds back to them with an explanation. As I read this explanation from Jesus, I would like for you to pay particular attention to verses 18 and 19, because that's what stood out to me throughout the week. So Jesus explains to his disciples, the farmer sows the word, this is verse 14. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown, As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Verse 18. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. Verse 19. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Now, like I said, when I read verses 18 and 19, I sort of stopped in my tracks. I had to take a hard look at myself because I didn't really want to identify with verses 18 and 19. But I found that I did. And then I considered the world around me and I considered some of the indictment against the church, just big capital C church. And I'm sure you've heard it too, is where is their fruit? Where is their impact? And it got really uncomfortable. 
I got uncomfortable because I asked, why does verse 18 and 19 feel so familiar? Why am I always worried? Why am I always worried? Why do I think more money will fix my problems? Why do I think that fixing my attention to a multitude of different information, self-help, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, what we see on the talking heads on news, why do I think that that's gonna help fix my problems? There's that fly. (laughs) And then more frustratingly, is why does it feel so easy to fall into that way of living? It's frustrating because I know better, right? Like I'm supposed to be a good Christian. I'm not supposed to worry and have anxiety. I know that money is the root of all evil, but yet I'm right over here. And I don't necessarily think it's an indictment, but more it's an invitation that Jesus is giving to his listeners. In some sense, it's supposed to be frustrating. I have a tree in my backyard that we've owned since we moved into the house well over three years ago, and we were told it is a fruit-bearing tree. Guess what? I don't see any fruit. It's frustrating. I want to know what this thing is. I have a pluot tree. I have a fig tree. I have a lime tree. I have apple tree. And I have this bumpy, ugly tree that's supposed to be a fruit tree. When are you going to produce fruit? It's supposed to cause discomfort because Jesus is speaking to a very natural human experience. So, I'm curious if you noticed as I was reading the passage or maybe even as you're looking at it now, did you notice what happens when the word is choked out by thorns? I even said it just now, choked out. And when I hear the word choked out, what does that usually mean? dead, right? This fly. (laughs) I guess it's appropriate to flies flying around me while I'm talking about death. Um, It doesn't say that it dies. It says what? Just like the tree in my backyard, it's unfruitful. It's still living. It's still growing. Yet, the word is not bearing fruit. Okay, Sean, so if we understand that worry and more money, less problems, and all of these different opportunities to find wisdom isn't going to work, what will work? Jesus says, verse 20, hear and receive the word, accept it, produce a a crop. My sermon's over. That's it, I can walk, right? Ed, you can get on the organ and you can play. Receive the word, accept it, produce a crop. If only it were so easy. But it's not easy. And I think an acknowledgement of our very human experience is it, and I hope, I think you'll agree with me on this, it's far easier to worry. It's far easier to look at our bank account and see more money going out than coming in. It's far easier to look for solutions all around us. Yet, we know that over time, as we progress along in that, as we worry, as we look at our bank account and almost pray in more money, or as we look to all of these different resources to provide a different way of living, inevitably, It doesn't work in the long run. There's always this gap. So how do we break free from this cycle? Well, I have two more questions for you. How is your hope this morning? And the second one is how is your imagination? Those two things are intrinsically woven together, hope and imagination. And that's why I chose the Ezekiel 37 text. You're like, Sean, that was a really long passage for you not to talk about. I chose it because of the passages, and there's many ridiculous passages in the Bible. As a literary device, I don't know that there's anything more wildly imaginative and equally ridiculous 
than Ezekiel 37. Have any of you come across dry bones that have come to life? No. When Jane was reading it for you, I'm curious, and obviously I would love to have a dialogue. It's a little challenging to do that with you there and I'm here. But what was your reaction to that passage? What did that do inside of you? Do you think it's possible, probable? Did it provoke curiosity in you? See, this is why it's so important, is because as challenging as it may be for you and I to take hold of a text like Ezekiel 37 and say, yeah, that's, that's true. And by the way, it's, it's a metaphor. It didn't really happen. At least we don't have records of it happening is that it was far more likely for the original recipients to have, be even more challenged by it. So I can locate you in their story. The moment when Ezekiel receives this prophecy, the Judean exiles are in Babylon, and they're in a, a, a very small group of people. At this point, their temple has been destroyed, reduced to rubble. And as a reminder, the temple is where the very presence of God was. So in some sense, it's a feeling of rejection. Not only do we not have the place of worship that we worship in, but we no longer have the very presence of God in our midst. So their temple is destroyed. Their city, Jerusalem, a center of power and authority, is destroyed. And they're cut off from their land because they're exiles. They're transported from a place that was their own that signified their very deep covenant with God and they're brought to a new place that is foreign. Now, some of the people, some of the, uh, the remnant of Judea, they went up the social ladder. But for the most part, they're just disoriented. Verse 11 actually describes Israel's state at the moment when Ezekiel is reading or projecting this prophecy to God's people. It says, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost and we are cut off completely. Just as an aside, have you ever had that feeling in your life before? When you just feel like, man, I feel like dry bones. If you ever wonder what dry bones are like, have you ever had Necco wafers before? <laughs> dry bones. And when you put a Necco wafer in your mouth, my guess is that you're not like, oh my gosh, this is the best tasting candy I've ever had in my life. If it's your favorite candy, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's really hard to imagine a world that's different when life feels like you're eating chalk. And that's Israel's experience here, is they're beaten down, they're broken up, they're, they're destroyed, they're wondering if they even have a God anymore, because there's, there, how are we covenant people? Anything that represents the world around us that we're covenant people is destroyed. New life and new hope. It's really hard to find that in the ashes of something that was once beautiful. And that was the point of Ezekiel 37, is God was making it as clear as possible. If you look at the text, it actually says that Ezekiel was taken to and fro between the bones, led by God. God is literally in the ruins of his people, alongside of them seeing them in their devastation. And so in the midst of their devastation, in the midst of their destruction, he paints for them a wildly imaginative reality. One that is so improbable that we who know science now could say, as far as we know, that's not possible. You can't take dry bones and bring life. And yet he paints this picture for them that says, no, no, you can't, but I can. 
You can't, but I can. I mentioned before that sometimes I struggle in my hope and I struggle in my belief. And sometimes I feel kind of unfruitful. I don't know if I'm like the original recipients of Ezekiel where I'm like, everything's lost. I have so much to be grateful for. But I do wonder, how is our hope? How is our imagination? That God could say to you, I will bring these dry bones to life. And you're like, let's do it. I want to participate. Because as just as much as it's a wild, imaginative picture of what life will become for Israel, it's also an invitation to participate in this new way of living and being. And this is what we see in the ministry of Jesus time and time again as he goes to these places. We just talked, we went through a whole series of Jesus encountering people in the midst of their devastation and saying, let me provide you a new way of being, a new way of living. I will bring healing for those that require healing. Those that are lost, you are found. He goes into the dry places and he brings living water. This is the hopeful imagination of God. It's the very work of God. It's provoking transformation inside of us so that we can experience the imaginative work of God. And I wonder what that looks like for each of us. I wonder, taking it back to that story, how many of you, when that narrator gives that, stick out your hands, so you can use the force. How many of you would have stuck your hands out? All right. M many of us don't. Many of us don't. And I think that's one of the struggles that we are struggling through in the church right now is that God says, look, I've transformed your life. And all these people that you worship with, I've transformed their life too. So you're living testimonies of the transformative work of God. And now I'm, I want you to present that to the world. Transformation. I want you to go into your workplaces, into your grocery stores, into your neighborhood, and I want you to carry with you this imaginative, imaginative new reality. That what you see and hear, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. And we're like, okay. <laughs> I'm like that. So it's not an indictment, it's an invitation. Dry bones coming to life, and we get to participate. So I leave you with these last questions, ones that I've, I've already wrestled with and then I'm still wrestling with. This is a work in progress, and I wanna be very transparent about that with you. Is how is your hope? And how is your imagination? Let me pray for us this morning. Lord, I think there's times where there's sermons that are meant to be unfinished because the story is still being written in our lives in the sense of living experience. You've painted before Israel, a new reality. You've painted before us a new reality wrought out of your finished work on the cross, Jesus. In the last passage, in verse 20, it says that others like seed sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Lord, a crop isn't just about fruitfulness. I think it's meant to be a harvest that's supposed to be shared with other people. And so as we consider our hope, and as we consider our willingness to yield our practical over to your imaginative future, I pray that we would see greater fruitfulness, not just for us, but for the world around us. We pray this in your precious name, Jesus.
Amen. As a form of response, um, would you join me standing? We're going to sing together hymn number 515. Sing Jesus Came Into My Heart. <laughs> it's kind of a perfect song. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sean, for that encouragement and encourage you, if you are new or newish, to join us in about 15 minutes in the library room one uh, for a time to learn a little bit more about our church. Hope you can make it um, and receive now your benediction, which comes from Colossians chapter three. May the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, we are called to peace. May you be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another through wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs in the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, may you do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen.